Hello and welcome to another video looking at the five key quotations. Today I'm really excited because we're looking at London and I think this is your banker poem. I think this one will fit almost any question and it is the easiest one in the anthology to remember. So before we see the five quotations, remember I'm going to take you through this method, the FOSS way, where you look at the form, the opening, the language features, which we'll call soap aims here, the structure and the ending, and those five things will propel you to at least a grade seven. It's a fab poem, there's so much in it I could pick out, but that just gives you too much to revise. So these are the five quotations that we're going to focus on, and focusing on these, I promise you, will get you into grade seven territory and beyond. Right, the first point we want to make is about the form, because writing about form starts at grade 7 in the mark scheme. So we need to know that this is written in four-line stanzas. The name for a four-line stanza is a quatrain, uh, so it's written in quatrains, and it has a very regular rhyme scheme, which will be A, B, A, B. So street and meet, flow and woe. Now, this is a really simplistic form. It's childlike in its simplicity. So the form says that it is like a ballad or like a poem written for children. Well, I have to get marks by relating that to the meaning. So Blake is writing this as a protest poem. It is a political poem. And in order to get that political message across and that protest across, he writes it in a way that is so memorable, even children can remember it. And that's why he chooses this particular form. And I've already told the examiner, she or he needs to consider my answer as grade seven or above. Now let's get into the first quotation. I wander through each chartered street. I'm going to zoom in on the language choice here of chartered. So it's got the word chart in it. So one meaning of chartered is that the streets have been mapped, which we consider to be a really helpful thing. But Blake is arguing the opposite. He's complaining about the expansion of cities. The word you want for that is urbanization. So he's complaining about urbanization, destroying what was once natural, which is why you get the Thames, an image of nature in the next line. But the other meaning of chartered is that this means that everything in the city is owned. The king has chartered out the areas. So what was once free common parkland has now had a street built on it. And that street's owned by other people, not by you, the people. Uh, you have to rent your accommodation. So what he's now saying is that streets make people poorer. They can no longer enjoy the freedoms that they once had. Now, in contrast, however, he begins with I wander. Contrast, remember, is a structural technique, which also puts you in the high grades. He's showing us that we can still be free and wander like him, as long as we start looking at London in a different way. Okay, now we go to our second quotation. Now there's some brilliant stuff here which I've had to ignore. You can find that in my other videos because I'm trying to be efficient for the exam. So my subject terminology here is going to be metaphor. This is where he zooms in with a brilliant metaphor here. The mind forged manacles I hear. I can also refer to the alliteration. Alliteration I can link to the idea of being memorable which links to what we already said about form. Manacles is another image of oppression, imprisonment. So just like chartered, he's saying that we are owned by something else. What is it? Well, it's something mind forged. So this is much more interesting. He is suggesting that we have done this to ourselves. It is our own minds that have put us in this kind of jail. What's he arguing here? Well, this idea that we have a social hierarchy with the king at the top, and then the nobility, and then the rich, and then the poor underneath, 
is actually not necessarily real. It only works because the people at the bottom respect the people further up who respect the people further up and everyone respects the king. But what he's saying is that this is just a construct. This is just the way society is organized in our minds. But if we stop believing in those powers, then we can live truly free lives. And he's going to illustrate that to us in the rest of the poem. Then there is the two meanings to the word forged. So the forge is the mini factory, if you like, that the blacksmith owns, filled with his furnace where he manipulates the metal into shapes. But forge also has the other meaning that we understand, which is to fake things. And Blake does that deliberately. What he's saying here is that our belief in social hierarchy in the class system is a fake way of looking at the world and he's going to show us a better one so that we can take off the manacles that are preventing us being free in our own minds. Right, let's have a look at the two parts of society he's attacking. One is the church and one is the palace. The church represents Christianity and the established Church of England and the palace represents the king and the institution of the monarchy. Let's get into this image here. So here we also have uh, a metaphor going on, but it's quite a complicated one. So every church is turning black. Well, that's a description. It's actually a literal description because it is coal smoke that's turning the buildings black. This literally happened. And that works because He's pointing out that the chimney sweepers are also getting covered in soot and dying from inhaling it uh, when they clean out the chimneys. His political point is that the church should do something about this. The church, through Jesus, is there to side with the meek and the helpless. That's part of Jesus' message, in fact a major part. And Blake is arguing that the church has lost its way. It's no longer following Christ's teaching, and it's now part of the establishment. The church owns an enormous amount of property. That's why there are so many churches. And it's just like the chartered streets, which are owned by the rich. The church is no different. Then he focuses on this really useful word here, which has got two meanings, just like Forge did. So appalls means shocks. And he's suggesting that the church should be shocked, at what's happening to all these chimney sweepers, these children being exploited and dying young. But he's saying, actually, the church doesn't do that. It doesn't complain. It doesn't try to change society for the better. Therefore, he's attacking the church for its complacency. Now, the second meaning of Paul is the black material cover that is put over a coffin. That is called a pall. Now he's suggesting that every church is wearing a pall. That's why every church is becoming black. This symbolizes that the church is dead. So effectively, the metaphor now suggests that the church has turned away from Christ's teaching and therefore is no longer the church. It is dead. It has no more religious authority because it's turned away from Christian uh, practice and belief. So real damaging attack there against the church. Now he follows this up with an attack against the king, the palace. So we have another metaphor where the soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. And he's asking us to imagine this huge political event that happened at the same time, or just before this poem, in France. It's the French Revolution, and in the French Revolution, all of the nobles, you know, starting with the king all the way down to the dukes and the counts and the earls, they were all executed. And what he's suggesting here is that this kind of revolution that happened in France is very likely to happen in our own country. And what he's therefore suggesting is that these soldiers will die at home defending the king against the people. So he's preaching the idea that society is now so corrupt 
with the rich having so much power and wealth that the poor will rise up and kill them and set up a new republic, just like in France. So there's our context. However, that's where the poem should end, if that was his main point. But we've got a volta here, which means a change in the poem, where he's going to get rid of his attack on political uh, power and now start attacking male power. You should remember that this is the patriarchy or the patriarchal society. Let's see how he does it. His final line, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse, focuses on the institution of marriage. Now, he doesn't seem to be arguing that marriage is another form of mind-forged manacle. He's not suggesting that marriage is wrong. In fact, he married an illiterate wife uh, through love, taught her to read, and then taught her to work as an equal partner in his engraving business. Now, why that particular context is important is it shows that for his time, William Blake was a feminist. He believes in equality for women, uh, you know, as far as anyone can in this society, and he lives that out in his own marriage. No, so he's not complaining against marriage here. What he's complaining about is men. And men are killing off their marriages. That's why there's a hearse involved in this metaphor. And the means of killing it off are plagues. And this is a reference to sexually transmitted diseases. Well, a sexually transmitted disease was incurable. There were no antibiotics at that time. And therefore, this would literally kill their wives. Uh, over time, it wasn't an instant death. It would happen over decades. But... If you gave birth while you had a venereal disease, uh, the chances are that your infant, your child, would also be born with a disability. And so he's also got in mind lots of children being born in these corrupt cities, um, and they're disabled, and that's not like a disabled person today who's able to live a complete and fulfilled life. Um, they'd be totally stigmatised back in Blake's time, and this is because the men of the marriage are going out and having sex with prostitutes, that's where the harlot's curse comes in, uh, and this is again a symbol of the abuse of women, so prostitutes are young, he's attacking the society that creates uh, an economy in young women being forced out to earn money through sex, and men who don't worry that they're young and don't worry that they're getting exploited and obviously um, having sexually transmitted diseases. So now his political attack against social hierarchy and the class system now comes back to the real big problem in society that's much worse than anything else he's mentioned and that is the behaviour of men that treats women as less important than themselves and treats the marriage vows as less important. So men are corrupt pretending that um, visiting prostitutes is okay as long as their partners don't find out about it. And he's looking at the real damage that that does physically through the transmission of disease. So by focusing on the ending here, I've, ab I've been able to show a change in interpretation. And hopefully you've got used to me banging on about the ending of every text you ever read because writing about the ending will always get you top grades as it forces you to write about more than one interpretation. Now we talked about the ending and the Volta and that gives us an insight into structure and we've scored marks there by saying how this affects our interpretation of the poem. We've talked about the language features because I've given you contrast and metaphor um, it's not your fault that metaphor keeps popping up. Um, you know, you don't have to have find different um, language features. We've also looked at alliteration in there. We've analysed the opening because that's where we saw his first point of view. And that means that our essay has shown a change in point of view, which is a sophisticated way of analysing the text. And because we've written about the form, the examiner has to consider putting us in the top mark band.
So I hope I've convinced you that even if you're currently writing at a grade 5, that actually grade 7 is entirely possible for you now. Uh, and I hope you're looking at your anthology, which is probably absolutely chock full of notes, and thinking, gosh, do you know what? I can really simplify this. I can definitely get five quotations in my head for the exam. I think I can do it. I'm going to make it. Well, let me know in your comments below. If you do make it in the mocks, if you do get uh, really much better grades than you thought you could, and if you're watching this uh, just before the actual real exams, let me know in August how you've done. It's always great to hear. And if you'd like to continue getting great advice, of course, don't forget to subscribe over here somewhere. Thank you very much. See you soon on my channel.